Yes, I did, because I love you. You're the best decision I ever made, I just forgot. I continue to come back to this undeniable truth, I am still alive. With odds like that, those three words are more miraculous than you can imagine. He had many friends, yet he felt incredibly lonely. He concealed the childhood wounds and self-doubt behind his bright humor. He didn't want to be remembered only by the name Chandler Bing, and he saw his mission as helping those lost in life. Today on The Famous People channel, we will tell the story of Matthew Perry, a comedian with a tragic fate, a life cut short too suddenly. What made 14-year-old Matthew start drinking? What did he pray for three weeks before starting the world's most famous television show? What connects Perry and his famous character, Chandler Bing? Who does Perry regret breaking up with the most? We will discuss this, as well as his friends, his fans, and a big revelation in today's video. It will be both fun and poignant, but you're sure not to be indifferent. Sit back, and let's begin. Matthew Langford Perry was born on August 19, 1969, to John Bennett Perry and Suzanne Marie Langford. Perry's parents met in 1967 at the annual Miss Snow Queen Beauty pageant at the University of Canada in Ontario. Suzanne was an honorary guest there because she had won the title the year before. And John performed as part of the Serendipity Music Group at the concert dedicated to this event. The young and attractive couple that evening couldn't take their eyes off each other, and their acquaintance later turned into passionate love. The couple moved to Perry's hometown, Williamstown, Massachusetts, and two years later, they had a baby boy. The baby was very restless, constantly crying due to stomach pain, and after a month of sleepless nights, the exhausted parents turned to a pediatrician for help. He prescribed an extremely powerful sedative for the one-month-old child. At the time, few people considered the side effects of such drugs, especially on the fragile psyche of a child. This medication silenced the cries of a hundred people. The child fell asleep with a smiling face, sometimes making cheerful sounds, and at least the young parents could get some rest for a while. Perhaps it was these strong sedative doses that ultimately led to Matthew's ability to tolerate banned substances, resulting in his lifelong struggle with addiction. Furthermore, these medications also had a significant impact on his sleep. However, John and Suzanne's family life was not smooth, and they decided to separate quite quickly. At that time, Matthew was only nine months old. One day, his parents got into a car and drove 5.5 hours to the Canadian border. Near Niagara Falls, Warren Langford was waiting for his daughter and grandson. Right there, the young couple put the final point in their relationship. I was told that my dad took me out of the car seat, handed me over to my grandpa, and then he quietly left me and my mom. John went to California to pursue an acting career, while Matthew had to stay with his 21-year-old mother, trying to raise him alone. One day, when Perry was three years old and attending preschool, he lost part of his finger in an accident while playing with other kids. Perry didn't cry and comforted his mother, saying, Mom, don't cry, I'm not crying. The boy took on the role of the man in the family and felt his mission was to ensure peace for his mother. However, he always felt ashamed of losing his finger and felt inadequate for six years. One day, when he was nine years old and boarding a plane, the pilot noticed and questioned him about his missing finger. Perry had to reveal the truth about his missing finger. However, the pilot also had a similar imperfection, and from then on, Perry shed his insecurity. Matthew Perry's story also shares many similarities with the character Chandler Bing in Friends, who also has a physical disability. And it's not coincidental at all. Matthew Perry lived with his mother, who was the press secretary to Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, and often felt lonely when his mother had to work away from home. He tried to get his mother's attention by making jokes and telling stories. After his father left the family, he feared that his mother might also abandon him. Despite Perry's efforts to make his mother smile with his jokes, he still felt lonely. He tried to capture his mother's attention by making jokes. 
He said, my mom is really beautiful, she's a star in every room she enters. And she's definitely the reason I'm funny. The relationship between Chandler and his mother was also challenging. She was a beautiful, successful author who always attracted attention from fans and men. Chandler wanted his mother to pay more attention to him, at least to spend less time with other men and give him a portion of her love. Matthew felt like the man of the house, someone his mother could rely on. He always saw the men his mother met as potential replacements for his father. Every time a new person entered Suzanne's life, it was a small tragedy for Perry. Matthew Perry later chose to become an actor after giving up a music career, first in New York and then in Hollywood. He became the official face of the Old Spice brand with his handsome appearance. However, he often felt more at home on screen than in real life. For Matthew, his father was a true superhero, handsome and courageous, and he always wanted to become a man like his dad. The young boy would often fly to Los Angeles to visit his father, hoping to spend time with him. One memorable moment was when his mother sent the five-year-old boy to visit his father by plane, and he felt lonely and scared. However, when he saw the lights of the city, he knew he was landing and would meet his dad. Since then, he always chose homes with panoramic views. On every birthday, he wished for his parents to reunite. Matthew always felt lonely and couldn't find a way to cure his loneliness. Meanwhile, Matthew gradually adapted to his new life. Suzanne, due to her frequent travels for work, initially left her son in Ottawa under the care of babysitters but later brought him to Toronto. At that time, she had married Canada AM host Keith Morrison and was preparing to have another child. Perry also had a sister named Caitlin, whom he deeply loved. However, he increasingly felt like an outsider in this happy family. He realized he didn't fit into this perfect picture with all his issues and insecurities. At that time, his bad behavior began to surface. He started getting low grades, smoking, and even once got into a fight with Pierre Trudeau's son, Justin Trudeau, who would later become the prime minister. He was only 10 years old at the time. Matthew jokingly said, I decided to stop arguing with him when he was put in charge of a whole army. When Perry was in seventh grade, his family moved to Ottawa. He attended Ashbury College, an all-boys school, and developed his sense of humor there. Once, he got the lead role in the school play, The Death and Life of Sneaky Fitch. Matthew recalled, it was a pivotal part, and I loved it, making people laugh like crazy. Afterward, he participated in all the school's productions. However, this didn't prevent him from continuing to engage in negative behaviors. He stole money, smoked more and more, and his academic grades declined. One day, teachers punished him by beating his desk to the point where he couldn't see anything beyond the wall because he talked too much and spent too much time making his classmates laugh. One of his teachers, Dr. Webb, once told Perry, if you don't change your lifestyle, you'll never accomplish anything. When he became famous and appeared on the cover of People magazine, he sent a copy to this teacher with a message that read, I guess you were wrong. While Perry's behavior still had many issues, his athletic achievements softened the attitudes of the teachers a bit. The truth is, Matthew had been playing tennis since he was young. My dad started teaching me to play tennis when I was four, and by the time I was eight, I knew I could beat him, but I had to wait until I was ten. He trained for eight to ten hours a day and dreamed of competing at Wimbledon and having a professional career in the sport. Perry wanted to win many awards, hold the coveted trophy, and hopefully gain his mother's attention. At 14 years old, I was nationally ranked in Canada. Matthew recalled, but that's when something else began. 1.3 People who drink often think they're escaping, but in reality, they're facing undiagnosed mental disorders. Matthew had his first taste of alcohol at the age of 14. He believed it could make life brighter, alleviate pain, and loneliness. When his friends, Chris and Brian, came over to hang out, they decided to try wine and beer together. Matthew's parents were not at home, 
and after 15 minutes, they were all intoxicated. Matthew found inner peace and realized he was different. Alcohol brought happiness, with no initial side effects. However, Matthew didn't start drinking immediately, but it marked the beginning of a harmful habit. As he grew older, he cared about his daughter and went through a damaging experience that nearly destroyed his life. One day, the girl he liked suggested taking their relationship to the next level. Matthew, anxious and angry after drinking six beers earlier and failing, self-diagnosed himself as impotent. This belief ingrained itself in his mind, where fear, desire, anger, and despair coexisted. Matthew's family grew apart, and his relationship with his mother deteriorated. Arguments became frequent, and only when he played tennis did he feel comfortable, even though he would worry and cry after each match. Matthew decided to live closer to his father in Los Angeles. The family was considering sending him to the Nick Belletieri Tennis Academy in Florida. This led to Matthew embarking on a new journey in his career and life. Later on, Matthew couldn't achieve the same level of success in the United States as he did in Canada, and his dream of winning Wimbledon fell apart. Perry realized that his life had to change. He chose to attend a prestigious private school and began an acting career, following in the footsteps of his father. When John discovered this, he didn't say much but gave his son a book titled, Acting Stylishly, with a message inside, Another Generation is Going to Hell. Love, Dad. In the evenings, he would often drink vodka and take vitamins in front of Matthew, always praising it as the best thing that happened all day. As Matthew grew up, he also started drinking, but there was a difference in this habit. After six drinks in the evening, Perry remained sober and functional, while Matthew struggled the next day and couldn't function normally. Matthew didn't realize the terrifying consequences of alcohol addiction until his father completely quit drinking and only stopped for one day. For him, it was a long battle to sobriety. He sought various forms of support, I spent $7 million trying to get sober. I attended 6,000 AA meetings. I went to rehab 15 times. I went to a mental hospital, and I did therapy twice a week for 30 years, almost died. However, when he was young and newly famous, he felt that fame saved him from loneliness. Inspired by his famous father's life, Matthew Perry embarked on an acting career. In 1983, he appeared in the comedy series, Not Necessarily the News, and two years later, he had a guest role in the first season of the sitcom, Charles in Charge, playing Ed, a wealthy young man who only says one line, my dad is from Princeton and is a surgeon, I want to follow in his footsteps. In 1987 and 1988, he played the lead role of Chaz Russell in the television series, Second Chance, later renamed, Boys Will Be Boys. He auditioned for a role alongside his father, but only he was chosen, while John Perry distanced himself from the project. John didn't stand in the way of his son's involvement and later appeared on the set only in the final episode in a supporting role. At just 17 years old, Matthew Perry was earning $5,000 a week from his acting career, a significant sum for a teenager. He dropped out of school and enjoyed the life of an actor, becoming confident and attracting many girls with his humor. One day, while joking around with friends at a coffee shop, director William Richard invited him to audition for his film, A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon. Matthew successfully auditioned and played the role of the protagonist's friend. This role was relatable to Perry because he was afraid of getting close to girls after his initial painful experiences. The lead role in the film was portrayed by River Phoenix, who later became close friends with Matthew. However, River Phoenix's sudden death from a drug overdose five years later shocked Perry. He and River often drank after work, played pool, and met girls together. Around the same time, he met a girl named Trisha Fisher, and they later began dating. Matthew was 18 years old at the time, and he wanted to be intimate while ensuring that there would be no consequences. Trisha began to suspect that something was amiss and quickly discovered the issue. Matthew told her about his unsuccessful first intimate attempt, and strangely, 
this did not push her away. Instead, for Trisha, it became a challenge. However, initially, things didn't work out between them. Perry's psychological trauma haunted him. It didn't have any effect, and Matthew withdrew from the relationship. I sat there, he continued the story, so gently and sadly, my two hands cupped on my lap like a nun in afternoon prayers, trying my damnedest to hide my embarrassment and maybe a tear or two. But Trisha understood him and helped him confront his lack of confidence. From then on, he no longer had any issues with intimacy. However, Perry ended the relationship with her early on, but they got back together when Friends was becoming very popular. While their relationship was not a good one, Fisher would leave a lasting impression on Perry. Although the scenes with Perry in the movie A Night in the Life of Jimmy Reardon only lasted three weeks, he was allowed to stay until the filming was finished. It was fantastic, fun, and carefree. After returning to Los Angeles, Matthew faced harsh reality. His grades in school did not improve, and hundreds of auditions yielded no results. He played numerous roles in comedy series with multiple episodes but found little success. Upon graduating, his only wish was to reunite with his parents. This wish came true, and Matthew realized that his parents' decision to separate was the right one. However, a decade later, Suzanne and John found themselves sharing a room again, but for entirely different reasons. Meanwhile, Perry's life became wild, he went out with friends and continued to drink heavily. He became an expert in two fields in the 1980s, tennis and drinking. He admitted that only one of these two areas was important to save his life. In 1990, he landed a role in an episode of the famous 1990s TV series, Beverly Hills, 90210. There, he played Roger Azarian, a Beverly Hills tennis star and the son of a businessman. This role reflected the professional type with Matthew Perry's emotional baggage, as his initial roles were quite similar. He was only 22 when he took on this role. Perry had various roles, but success and fame didn't come quickly to him. In the same year, Perry starred in the sitcom, Sydney, as the older brother of the main character portrayed by Valerie Bertinelli. The project ended after its first season, but it had two significant outcomes for Matthew. He formed a friendship with Craig Bierko, who would later become one of his closest friends. Their company also included David Pressman and Hank Azaria, known for his role as the scientist Phoebe loved on Friends. Another memorable moment from the Sydney show was Perry's unrequited love for his on-screen sister, Valerie Bertinelli, who was married to musician Eddie Van Halen. Perry couldn't hide his feelings and even led to an awkward situation when he and Valerie kissed in the living room of the Van Halen home while Eddie was asleep. Although their romance didn't continue, Perry moved forward in his life. While his early life was adventurous and financially irresponsible, his alcohol addiction began to impact his financial situation. Money dwindled, and finding new work became more challenging. However, life gave Matthew a new opportunity. Without any support systems, Perry reached out to all of his agents and begged them to find him at least one project. Finally, an opportunity came his way. It was a sci-fi comedy film about baggage handlers at Los Angeles International Airport called LAX 2194. Matthew was paid $22,500 for this role, enough to ensure a comfortable life for a while. However, at the same time, he read a script for another project called Friends Like Us. After reading this script, he realized he had made a massive mistake. His contract for LAX 2194 didn't allow him to take on new projects. Furthermore, he saw a striking resemblance between himself and one of the characters in Friends Like Us. He said, when I read the Friends Like Us script, it was as if someone had been following me for a year, stealing my funny stories, copying my style and outlook on the tired but joyful life. One character stood out to me, I didn't think I could play Chandler, I was Chandler. Worse yet, someone he knew also started auditioning for the role of Chandler and asked Matthew for advice on how to play it best, as they thought he looked a lot like Perry. 
His friend Hank Azaria also auditioned twice, initially for the role of Joey. Later, he was cast as a scientist who loves Phoebe and won an Emmy for that role. Perry Riley remarked, I did 237 episodes and didn't get squat. Matthew practiced reading lines with other actors so frequently that he quickly memorized all the lines, and every three to four days, he would call his agents and ask them to come up with something to get through the dialogue. Matthew Perry auditioned for the role of Chandler Bing in the sitcom Friends Like Us, and from the very first pages of the script, he felt that this show would be a huge success. Perry saw the humorous dialogue, the vibrant characters, and could empathize with the everyday issues and daily anxieties of the six friends from New York. He wanted to be a part of this project and just be one of the fortunate friends. However, one day, his friend Craig Bierko was also offered roles in two projects, Best Friends and Friends Like Us, where he auditioned for the role of Chandler. At that time, other actors had already been cast, but the role of Chandler was still vacant. Craig asked Perry which role he should choose, and Perry advised Bierko to try to join the cast of Friends, even though he himself wanted that role with all his heart. However, Craig Bierko did not heed Perry's advice and accepted a leading role in another project called Best Best Friends. Therefore, the role of Chandler remained vacant. But this opened an opportunity for Perry, and he wasn't going to let it slip away. Perry auditioned again and eventually landed the role of Chandler Bing on Friends. Later on, Craig Bierko felt regret for not trying out for Friends and couldn't speak to Perry for a few years because he missed out on a significant opportunity, while Matthew Perry made the most of that chance. They later rekindled their friendship, and Perry admitted that this opportunity had changed his life. Let's go back to 1994. NBC producer Jamie Tarsus asked her husband, Dan McDermott of Fox TV, about the success of LAX 2194 and received a negative response. She then inquired about Matthew Perry auditioning for the role of Chandler Bing and got an affirmative answer. Matthew Perry, at 24 years old, had the opportunity to showcase his talents at an audition without a script. He impressed the show's creator, Marta Kaufman, by reciting lines from memory. He succeeded in the three auditions and became Chandler Bing on Friends. Before the audition, Perry read about Charlie Sheen and prayed to become famous. He had read an article about Charlie being famous and embroiled in a controversy. However, Matthew didn't understand why Charlie had to worry because he was already a worldwide famous actor. Surprisingly, he got down on his knees and started praying, Dear God, you can do anything with me. Just please make me famous. God granted Matthew's wish. God made Matthew famous. And he also fulfilled the first part of the deal. Ultimately, everything in life comes at a cost. Fear your desires, they may become true. Now, for all these years, I am quite sure I was made famous so I would not waste my life trying to become famous. You have to become famous to know that's not the answer. And no one who isn't famous will truly believe that. Matthew Perry shared. Success came to him, but it required him to sacrifice a part of his life. Let's reminisce about Friends and Chandler Bing. Subscribe to our channel, The Famous People, so you don't miss out on new videos about famous stars. Recently, I've come to understand the significance of Friends to everyone, Matthew Perry shares. The cast got together for the first time to get acquainted after being cast. For Perry, all the actors except Jennifer Aniston were newcomers. However, he had met Aniston three years before Friends and developed feelings for her. She had rejected dating and suggested being friends. Perhaps it was fate's twist. During the time leading up to playing Friends, Perry had to hide his emotions. Director Jimmy Burroughs understood that to have genuine chemistry on screen, the actors needed to be friends off screen. Instead of reading the script at a round table, he organized gatherings at Monica's apartment to foster communication and understanding. After a long chat, they had lunch together. Courtney Cox, who played Monica Geller, said, There were no stars here, 
this was an ensemble show. We all had to be friends. From that day on, the actors became close. They ate together, played poker, and didn't need separate dressing rooms. Perry always brought laughter and joy, much like Chandler. At the end of the first day, he felt happy and looked forward to seeing everyone the next day, the people who would become his close friends for many years. The next day, the entire cast gathered for a read-through in front of a large crowd, including writers and production staff. Then they rehearsed at Monica's apartment, and everything went beautifully. Enthusiasm began to flourish as they realized that the show could become a mega-hit, bringing success and recognition for all. During their work, the excitement never stopped. They filmed each episode, fostering closer friendships. Creativity was essential, and the humorous stories were continuously improved. Lunchtime chats with the actors helped the directors add personal details to their characters, making them more relatable on screen. Perry then said, during the lunchtime chat, I said two things, first, I had terrible luck with women, and my relationships often ended in disasters, second, I wasn't comfortable with silence, I always had to please everyone with jokes. Chandler became the funny one in the group of friends and ended up failing in romantic relationships. The actors put their heart and soul into their characters, and during the first season, they were completely creative and made no mistakes. Everything continued to go smoothly, and by the summer of 1994, they were ready for the show's first season. However, at that time, nobody knew about Friends, and the actors still maintained anonymity when out in public. They went through a summer before the show aired on television. Matthew recalled three events from that summer, starting with a trip to Las Vegas with the cast when they were still unknown to the world. The second was a trip to Mexico, where Perry relaxed and enjoyed drinks with some girls. The third event was a short-lived romance with an unknown actress at the time, Gwyneth Paltrow. They met at the Williamstown Theatre Festival in Massachusetts, where they both performed throughout the summer. They shared beautiful memories, visiting waterfalls, having beers at the local college bar, and experiencing romantic moments in the countryside. Although they later broke up and remained friends, that summer romance remained etched in their memories. After deciding to name the show, Friends, it was scheduled to air on Thursdays at 8.30 p.m., between two highly popular shows, Mad About You and Seinfeld. This was a strategic move and helped boost the ratings of Friends. The premiere took place on September 22, 1994, and initially, it ranked 17th, a good start for a new project. Despite some initial negative reviews, Friends climbed to the top 10, then the top 5, and never dropped below the fifth position since then. In 1995, Friends won the People's Choice Award for Favorite New Television Comedy Series for its impressive first season. Matthew Perry shared his experience at the ceremony. After the successful first season, David Schwimmer, who had more film experience than the other actors, decided to renegotiate his contract to ensure everyone received the same amount of money per episode, regardless of their level of involvement. This action not only had a positive impact on the project's future but also created unity and fairness within the team, leaving the six friends with no reason to be envious. This may have contributed to the global success and recognition of the show. What about you? Share your favorite episode of Friends. Meanwhile, Perry was at the peak of his career. At 25 years old, he had finally achieved everything he had hoped for. However, did this bring him happiness? He shared his thoughts in an interview with The Guardian, I've been in a lot of TV shows, and Friends is the most watched. But none of those shows have really changed my life the way I thought it would. Following the resounding success of the first season of Friends, the decision was made to start filming the second season. In the episode, the one after the Super Bowl, they decided to invite big stars like Jean-Claude Van Damme, Brooke Shields, Chris Isaac, and Julia Roberts. Marta Kaufman, one of the creators of the show, told Matthew Perry that Julia Roberts would join only if there was an intriguing storyline for Chandler, and, first of all, she needed to be captivated by the idea. 
This task fell on Perry's shoulders. He decided to send the actress dozens of roses along with a card that read, The only thing more interesting than the show you're about to join is that I finally have a reason to send you flowers. As for Julia Roberts, she replied that she would join if Matthew could explain quantum physics in a simple way for her. The very next day, he sent her what she requested via fax. Yes, in the pre-social media era, communication often took place via fax. Julia continued to ask many questions, and Matthew received help from all the friends, cast members to provide answers. Everyone was supportive and believed that Julia Roberts' heart would soon melt in the warmth of Matthew Perry. Eventually, she sent him a round loaf of bread, which was how their relationship began. It lasted for over three months, exchanging dozens, if not hundreds, of messages every day, discussing everything about life. Matthew Perry fell deeply in love with her, and they hadn't even spoken on the phone once, let alone met. Finally, one day, a fax arrived for Matthew with the words, call me, and a phone number. Overcoming his fear, he dialed that number and was surprised to find that they could easily converse. They talked for a marathon 5.5 hours, and from that point on, their phone relationship began. However, it existed only for a brief period. Eventually, Roberts showed up at Matthew Perry's apartment doorstep, and everything quickly unfolded. They became a couple before starring in the famous, Friends, episode. However, the relationship quickly ended, and Matthew Perry soon realized he needed to break up with Julia. Old insecurities had taken their toll on him. He recalled, dating Julia Roberts was too much for me. I was sure she would dump me, why wouldn't she? I'm not enough, I can never be enough, I was broken, messed up, unlovable. So, Matthew saw no better option than to end the relationship. Later, he deeply regretted this decision and always followed the success of the star he had lost forever. After the second season of Friends was filmed, Matthew Perry had his first leading role in the comedy film Fool's Rush In alongside Salma Hayek. For this project, he received his first ever $1 million paycheck. The filming took place in Las Vegas. One of the biggest challenges was shooting scenes out of order, and after a while, he had to suppress some emotions when looking at the ultrasound image of the baby in the womb. However, at that time, Matthew Perry had only known Salma Hayek for a few days, making it difficult to connect with those emotions. Salma Hayek suggested having meals together to try to get acquainted, but it didn't help much. In another scene, when Perry's character needed to cry, he was just thinking of something sad. But there's an interesting detail. The shooting lasted for 10 hours, and the director continuously demanded tears from Matthew. When he was exhausted from portraying all the emotions, the director asked him to reshoot the crying scene two more times. This made Matthew feel uncomfortable to the point where he actually started crying, and that take eventually made it into the film. In the romantic confession scene of the two main characters, Salma Hayek advised Matthew Perry to look past her, as if seeing their future together. However, Matthew Perry responded in his usual humorous manner, listen, Salma, you're saying in this scene that I love you. You can look anywhere you want, but I'm going to look at you. This reflects Perry's comedic style, as he often came up with ideas to make scenes funnier. The film's director, Andy Tennant, told him, you don't have to do that. You're interesting enough to watch without doing that. However, Andy still listened to some of Perry's suggestions. The line, you are everything I never knew I always wanted, proposed by Matthew Perry and added to the film Fools Rush In, became one of the most famous lines in the movie. He even considered it the best line he ever delivered in a film. However, during the filming of Fools Rush In, Perry encountered a dangerous incident while participating in jet skiing on Lake Mead. He had an accident and suffered serious injuries, especially to his neck. A doctor was called in and gave him painkillers. Later, he drove the character's Mustang up a mountain and took the painkillers himself. Initially, he felt comfortable and didn't think about the consequences of taking these drugs. He continued to take more, and after a while, 
he became addicted to the medication. Perry was swallowing 55 pills a day for a year and gained over 128 pounds. Eventually, he had to check into a drug rehabilitation center, facing the risk of life and death. This was just the beginning of Matthew Perry's battle against addiction and substance abuse, and he had to confront many failures and challenges in this journey. Matthew Perry's battle with alcohol and painkiller addiction had a significant impact on his weight. He mentioned that he could track his addiction's trajectory through his weight. When he gained weight, it was due to alcohol addiction, and when he lost weight, it was because of painkillers. Perry fell into a state of malnutrition due to a lack of appetite caused by his addiction. His only thought every day was where he could get more painkillers. His dosage of pills reached up to 55 per day, and if he didn't take them, he would become extremely sick. Perry tried everything to procure the pills, including calling doctors with fake ailments and searching through the bathroom cabinets of his friends. Following the success of Friends, Perry took on another project, the movie Almost Heroes, with Chris Farley. He received $2 million US dollars for this role. However, due to both actors struggling with addiction, the filming process encountered numerous difficulties, and the movie was nearly unfinished. Matthew Perry's battle against addiction left him constantly ill, malnourished, and with various health issues. However, after a period of resistance and support from a rehabilitation center, he managed to overcome his addiction and improve his health. The fourth season of Friends was a time when Perry felt better and looked significantly healthier after his recovery process. However, he was not entirely sober for an extended period after his discharge. Just 68 days after leaving rehab, Perry started drinking again, and he continued to do so daily until 2001. Meanwhile, he participated in the film Three to Tango and developed a romantic relationship with his co-star on set, Neve Campbell. However, as was customary for Perry, this relationship became complicated, when I get someone, I have to leave them before they leave me, because I'm not enough, and I'm about to get found out, but when the person I want doesn't choose me, that just proves I'm not enough, and I've been found out. The film received poor reviews and performed terribly at the box office. Matthew Perry faced many personal and career challenges during this period. He experienced health issues due to the impact of addiction, including pancreatitis, and had to be hospitalized. His relationship with his girlfriend at the time was also under significant pressure. He struggled with drug addiction and frequently sought ways to obtain drugs. After his hospitalization, Perry temporarily lived with his father but continued to use addictive substances. He went through many dangerous situations due to his mental state and addiction. This challenging journey left lasting scars and traded off his future health. During the filming of the fifth season of Friends, Jennifer Aniston unexpectedly walked into Matthew Perry's dressing room and found him drinking alcohol. Clearly, he had been trying to conceal his addiction for a long time. However, he didn't want to admit it to his friends and didn't want them to worry about him. So, he promised to stop drinking and replace some pills with others to reduce the dosage. During the break between the fifth and sixth seasons, Matthew Perry was offered the lead role in The Whole Nine Yards, alongside Bruce Willis. He accepted the offer, and the filming took place in Montreal, Canada. The cast was great, and director Kevin Pollock allowed the actors to improvise and contribute creative ideas during the filmmaking process. In his role, Matthew Perry had to face Bruce Willis and pair up with Natasha Henstridge. He successfully fulfilled his task, and the film was a success. During their work together, Bruce Willis often organized all-night parties at the penthouse of the Intercontinental Hotel in Montreal, and Perry used a strong sedative to help his body relax after a demanding work schedule. However, the use of sedatives can interact negatively with alcohol. Bruce Willis rented nearby houses to ensure no one disrupted their stay. However, after some photos were leaked, media attention increased significantly. The Whole Nine Yards became the number one film in the United States for three consecutive weeks and received praise from critics, 
especially for the performances of the two lead actors, Matthew Perry and Bruce Willis. The film was a financial success, grossing approximately $106 million for the producers. Bruce Willis, even though he didn't believe in the film's success, made a bet with Matthew Perry. According to the agreement, if the film succeeded, Willis would guest star for free in three episodes of Friends. As a result, he appeared in the sixth season of Friends, and even won an Emmy Award for his role. However, despite the success of the first installment, the sequel, The Whole Ten Yards, did not receive favorable reviews. The film was shot in Los Angeles and faced various difficulties, with a script that didn't match up to the first installment. It performed poorly at the box office and received low ratings on Rotten Tomatoes, with only a 4% approval rating. The decline in his physical condition and the resurgence of his drug addiction made Matthew Perry's situation worse. Colleagues and film crews began to worry about him, and a sobriety monitor was hired to keep an eye on him. However, Perry left the familiar environment to shoot the film, Serving Sarah. Due to his unstable health, he had to temporarily suspend filming and pay a fine of up to $650,000. He then had to be hospitalized at another rehabilitation center in Los Angeles. The film, Serving Sarah, was released in 2002 and performed poorly at the box office, grossing only $20 million against a production budget of $29 million. After an unsuccessful month of rehabilitation, Matthew Perry was transferred to another center in Malibu, where he continued treatment for an additional three months. It was here that he stumbled upon the book, Anonymous, by an alcoholic, and from that point, he began to gain a better understanding of his addiction and its underlying causes. At the same time, he seriously reflected on how his lifestyle and actions had affected his family and friends for the first time. Perry recalled, I was living in a sober house when Monica and Chandler got married. It was May 17, 2001. During his time at this center, he also watched the Oscars, and the award presented by Julia Roberts left a lasting impression on him. During this period, Perry not only had to deal with overcoming addiction but also had to readjust his life. His romantic relationships were constantly changing, and he couldn't find true love in any of them. His romantic relationships with actresses like Yasmin Bleeth, Gabrielle Allen, Maeve Quinlan, and Heather Graham lasted only a few months and were never publicly commented on. After three months of treatment, Perry successfully overcame his alcohol and stimulant addiction, ended his relationship with girlfriend Jamie Tarsus, and was ready to return to work. The final season of Friends marked a significant milestone in the actors' careers, but it was also the time when they started to feel bored with their roles in the series. Jennifer Aniston was the first to persuade the producers to shorten the final season because she had major film projects in the future. In the last episode of Friends, when all the keys were placed on the counter and the characters said their goodbyes to their everyday lives, Perry was the one who uttered the final line. He asked Marta Kaufman about it because it was important to him. However, when the scene ended, the entire cast began to cry, except for Matthew. He shared, I didn't feel a thing. He didn't know if this was because he was on medication or because he had almost lost his emotions inside. Despite the end of an important chapter in his life, Perry still looked towards the future with hope. He was preparing to release the sequel to The Whole Nine Yards, and he played leading roles in two episodes of the long-running TV series Ally McBeal and three episodes of The West Wing, where he received two Emmy nominations. In 2006, the TV movie The Ron Clark Story aired. The film told the story of a real-life teacher from a small town who took a job at one of the most troubled schools in Harlem. Matthew Perry portrayed a character named Ron Clark, an alcoholic who frequently cursed in front of his students. The film became a success and earned Perry several award nominations, including SAG, Golden Globe, and Emmy nominations, although he didn't win any awards and lost to Robert Duvall. While filming The Ron Clark Story, Matthew Perry was offered a role in the series Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, a project he liked. 
However, the proposed salary for him was only $50,000 per episode, while he had received over a million dollars per episode in the final season of Friends. After several negotiations, Perry's salary was eventually raised to $175,000 per episode. His co-star Matt LeBlanc received $600,000 per episode for the spin-off series, Joey. Working on this series was not smooth sailing because the show's creator, Aaron Sorkin, didn't allow improvisation and wanted Perry to work in a specific way. Although the pilot episode was positively received, the series was cancelled after its first season due to low viewership ratings. This left Matthew Perry unemployed and contemplating changes in his personal life. The relationship between Matthew Perry and Lizzie Kaplan started to get serious after four years of dating in 2006. On Christmas, Perry gave Lizzie a special gift, a painting of them together. In the painting, she held a copy of the New York Times and a water bottle while he held Red Bull and read a sports book. Throughout their time together, they wrote letters to each other, and he added 1,780 hearts to the painting, each heart representing a message they exchanged. All these little hearts were put together to form one giant heart. Lizzie accepted this gift, but Perry almost proposed on that day, though his sarcastic remark made the atmosphere difficult. Perry and Lizzie dated for a total of six years before they broke up, but they did not get married. Matthew Perry mentioned that it was right after the day he almost proposed that their relationship began to deteriorate. He said, I often think if I had proposed to her, we'd still be married with two children and a house. However, instead of that, he remarked that he was a lonely guy living in a house in his 50s. Apart from his relationship with Lizzie, Perry continued to develop his acting career. In 2007, he starred in the romantic comedy, Numb, where he played a clinically depressed screenwriter. The following year, he appeared in another comedy, Birds of America, portraying a difficult sibling relationship. Matthew Perry was rumored to have a brief romantic relationship with Lauren Graham, who played the wife of his character in the film, but he didn't comment on it. In 2009, Matthew Perry played the lead role in the fantasy comedy film, Seventeen Again. In this film, he portrayed the adult version of Mike O'Donnell, who is given a chance to go back to his teenage years and fulfill his dreams. The younger version of Mike was played by Zac Efron. Although the film received mixed reviews from critics, it became a box office hit. Many people criticized the casting of two entirely different actors in terms of physical appearance and personality for the same role. However, the film still attracted audiences. After struggling with addiction issues and addressing relationship problems, in 2011, Matthew Perry created his own sitcom called Mr. Sunshine. He played the lead character, Ben Donovan, a manager of the Sunshine Center, the second-largest sports arena in San Diego, California. The show depicted the daily events of people working in an unusual job. Perry played a significant role in developing this program and learned a lot about creating a television show from scratch. However, Mr. Sunshine couldn't maintain the audience's interest and was cancelled after 11 episodes. The following year, Perry starred in another series called, Go On, which centered on a sports radio host trying to cope with the death of his wife. Similar to his previous project, this endeavor also didn't last long and only ran for one season. In between these two projects, Perry had to attend rehab. Although his visits to rehab centers helped him stabilize his life and temporarily regain his health, he eventually veered off the right path again. After a long period of trying to stabilize his life and helping others overcome addiction, Matthew Perry met a man named Earl at one of the addiction support centers. Earl later became a sponsor for Perry. Alongside Earl, he went through all the steps of the Alcoholics Anonymous AA, support program to help control his addiction. Earl established a company and built sober living homes around Los Angeles. Perry invested $500,000 in this company and transformed his Malibu home into a sober living home called Perry House. Matthew and Earl participated in meetings with lawmakers in Washington, D.C., to advocate for the effectiveness of drug-related courts. 
These courts aim to legalize addiction by providing care and treatment instead of imprisonment. Perry received the Champion of Recovery Award from the National Drug Control Policy Office during the Obama administration in May 2013. However, over time, Perry's work and life faced changes and challenges. The sober living home in Malibu did not yield the expected results, and he had to sell it. Earl later did not return the $500,000 that Perry had invested, and he even fled to Arizona. Losing both a close friend and a substantial amount of money, Perry fell into a difficult situation and relapsed into substance use. After the disappointment of the Go On series, Matthew Perry went through a period of depression and relapsed into addiction, making his life challenging. He felt the need for a change and a breath of fresh air. That's when he joined the sitcom, The Odd Couple, a remake of the story of two friends after failed marriages who decide to live together. In the show, Matthew's on-screen partner was Thomas Lennon. Despite having good source material, an excellent cast, and hopes for a successful comeback, depression and addiction affected his effectiveness on set. He struggled to keep a schedule, was influenced by addiction, and couldn't even perform well in his scenes. Although the series, The Odd Couple, was not cancelled after its first season, the filming process became challenging for Matthew Perry. He wrote the play, The End of Longing, in which he played the lead role himself. This play was written quickly in 10 days but took another year to complete. The story of the play revolves around four people in their 40s searching for the meaning of life, with Matthew Perry playing the role of Jack, an alcoholic man. This play received mixed reviews from critics, with many praising Perry's first writing effort. Although Lizzie Kaplan, his former girlfriend, declined to attend the play, citing a busy schedule, in general, this play marked a new milestone in Matthew Perry's career after a difficult period of setbacks. In a subsequent email, she explained that she was getting married and no longer had time for friends. The male actor didn't respond to this email, and they haven't been in touch since. Matthew said, that's a brutal way to reveal she was getting married, but he didn't do the same with others. However, he will always be in her mind. Then, in 2017, Matthew returned to television with roles in The Good Fight and as Ted Kennedy in The Kennedys, after Camelot. Producers were concerned when offering the role with a high price, but Perry didn't care about the character's fame. He joined the project with a desire to try a different role. In July 2019, he had to be hospitalized for a ruptured intestine and underwent emergency surgery after the rupture. Doctors said he had only a 2% chance of surviving the night. Matthew spent five months in the hospital, including two weeks in a coma. He had undergone 14 stomach surgeries in his lifetime. He reminisces about his surgical scar in October 2022, which helped him stay sober. His girlfriend, Molly Hurwitz, stood by his side during this time. However, after getting engaged, things didn't go smoothly, and the wedding never took place. Perry's representative stated, sometimes things just don't work out, and this is one of them. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Perry had another near-death experience when he was admitted to a recovery center in Switzerland. He had to undergo surgery and was administered propofol. After 11 hours, he woke up in another hospital and was informed that his heart had stopped beating for five minutes. The process of cardiac pulmonary resuscitation was lengthy and resulted in eight broken ribs. After serious health and personal issues, in May 2021, during the special broadcast of Friends, many people didn't recognize that the tired, older-looking man was Matthew. Many years of struggle and horrifying experiences have taken a toll on him. During this meeting, Perry shared with his colleagues and friends the psychological difficulties he went through while filming each episode of the show. Furthermore, his autobiography, Friends, Lovers, and The Big Terrible Thing, is set to be published next year, where Perry will delve even further into his battle with addiction and behind-the-scenes insights into the famous show. The book is written in Matthew's characteristic candid, conscious, and humorous style, 
vividly recounting his lifelong struggle with the disease and its underlying causes. In a 2022 interview with People magazine, Perry revealed that he wrote the memoir to share with those who are facing addiction. He said, I say in the book that if I die, it'll be shocking but not surprising to anyone. And that's what I'm doing with this book. I want to share about the ups and downs because people are facing all sorts of difficulties, and if they hear a story from someone they've seen on TV, maybe it'll fill them with hope. That's important. During the release of the memoir, Perry has been sharing his life experiences through videos on Instagram. He emphasizes that addicts need to understand that they are not alone and that their disease can be overcome. There's a famous saying that people don't change. I coincidentally found out that people are changing all the time, and I see it every day, he said. I see people getting better, I see the light in their eyes turning on. They've overcome the horrific phase of addiction and can lead a normal life as long as they do a certain amount of work every day. Matthew Perry doesn't want to be remembered solely as Chandler Bing. What's important to him is leaving a mark in people's memories as someone who genuinely helped others. I want to be remembered as someone who lived well, loved genuinely, and was a seeker, Perry said in an interview. The book, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, is an emotionally charged memoir that delves into the deep details of Perry's lost love, his darkest days, and his closest friends. Critics have praised the book, and fans have been shocked by the candid and open story of their idol. The book takes you into the contemplation of, how close I came to death every day, is written in one part of the book. If only he had known, then he would have confronted the truth to what extent. Rest in peace, Matman. On October 28, 2023, the world was rocked by the news of the death of the Friends actor in a hot tub at his private residence in Los Angeles, California. Initial reports stated that no illegal substances were found at the scene, and there was no evidence of any violent behavior that could have led to the star's death. However, the investigation into Matthew Perry's death is still ongoing. Investigators are awaiting the results of a full toxicology examination after the autopsy. On November 1, 2023, law enforcement agencies conducted a preliminary check and found no common illicit substances in Perry's system. This confirms the actor's claims that he had been clean since 2021 in an interview with The New York Times in 2022. However, Conducting more detailed tests to determine whether there were any other illegal substances in his blood and whether there was an overdose of any prescription drugs will take more time. Perry's death occurred suddenly and without warning signs. He had spent the morning playing tennis and returned home after a two-hour workout on the court. Upon returning home, he delegated tasks to his assistant and then returned, but he was found unconscious and the 911 call was made. The news of the sudden death of the beloved actor came as a shock to everyone. His family, parents, and friends struggled to cope with this tragic loss. The actor's family released a statement in People magazine one day after the tragedy, expressing their profound grief over the loss of their beloved son and brother. Matthew Perry brought so much joy to the world, both as an actor and as a friend. Everyone meant so much to him and we appreciate the outpouring of love and immense support," the statement read. Perry's co-stars from Friends also expressed their agony at his departure, we are all deeply saddened by Matthew's loss. We were not just co-stars. We were a family, their statement read. There is much to say, but for now, we will take some time to mourn and process this immeasurable loss," the statement continued. At this time, our thoughts and love are with Matthew's family, his friends, and all those who loved him around the world. While the cause of Matthew Perry's death remains unconfirmed, many fans wonder if his sudden demise is related to his past health struggles, including his battle with addiction, and whether he sought help or not. The sudden death of a beloved and celebrated figure leaves many unanswered questions. The lack of answers has led conspiracy theorists to try to connect dots and create complex theories. One notable clue is a video Matthew posted a few days before his passing. 
He placed three cherries on a table with the words, this is what I have to eat today. I'm Matt Man. In some Instagram posts, he compared himself to the fictional DC superhero Batman. The combination of the actor's name and Batman seemed innocent until one conspiracy theorist claimed otherwise in a shocking post. According to this individual, the berries in the star's video were not blueberries as everyone thought but rather baneberries. Baneberries are a poisonous type of berry that could potentially be fatal if ingested. Some fans interpreted Perry's post as a cry for help, while others saw blueberries and associated them with Dolores O'Riordan from the band, The Cranberries, who had passed away in a bathtub. Friends and acquaintances who contacted him one or two days before the event did not notice any signs of depression. An Entertainment Tonight reporter, who interviewed Perry a day before his passing, talked about Matthew's future plans, including a biographical film with Zac Efron cast as the lead. However, an interview from a year prior showed Perry's intention not to commit suicide, even though he had admitted to past drug use that could threaten his health. Ultimately, Matthew Perry's funeral was held on November 3, 2023, at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles, near Warner Brothers. The funeral saw the participation of his friends, co-stars like Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, and David Schwimmer. Matthew Perry had battled alcohol and drug addiction for many decades. Before his passing, he had plans to establish a foundation to support individuals struggling with substance abuse. His family and loved ones executed this plan, and the Matthew Perry Foundation's website was launched on the day of his funeral. This foundation is committed to helping those struggling with addiction and honoring Matthew's legacy. It will be guided by his words and experiences, aiming to make a difference in as many lives as possible. We will remember Matthew Perry not only for his humorous roles on Friends, but also as a man who fought valiantly against his formidable demons throughout his life and wanted to support others facing similar challenges. If you'd like to learn about the fate of other actors from the Friends cast, please leave a comment to let us know. We appreciate your likes and subscriptions. This is the Famous People channel. See you in the next video.